In ancient Greece, women almost always got the short end of the stick. The gods took what they wanted, and if women were involved, they were, however innocent, invariably punished. In this episode, we look at the tragedy behind one of these many infatuations and learn the backstory of the girl who was turned into a monster. What happened? Very early in Greece's history, a beautiful young woman named Medusa worked as an attendant at one of Athena's temples. The head priestess required her attendants to be virgins. Therefore, within the columned walls of the temple, purity ruled. Athena herself was a proud virgin and expected virtuousness in her sanctuary. But there were attendants who failed this expectation. And Medusa? She was led astray by an Olympic god. One day, Poseidon, Zeus's brother, spotted her going about her duties. He vowed to seduce her. And so begins our story. This is episode 24 of Garner's Greek Mythology. We have listeners from 127 countries and counting. Welcome to everyone, wherever you are. I'm your host, mythologist and best-selling author, Patrick Garner. These stories about the gods have been told for thousands of years, but now there are new stories that are as compelling. If you haven't done so already, check out my books about the gods in the contemporary world. You can read more about them and this podcast at patrickgarnerbooks.com. And as always, this podcast will focus on one thing, Greek gods, of course. Here, the ancient gods are not considered imaginary. Hardly. Instead, they, like you, are here now. Medusa was an innocent who had never experienced love. Poseidon disguised himself as a temple supplicant, appearing before her when she was alone. He was maddeningly handsome, his muscles obvious even though he was cloaked. His hair flowed in curls, and his eyes danced as he spoke. He used divine persuasion to convince her that she should spend time with him. She succumbed, but they weren't alone. Hardly. Little did Medusa know that Athena herself was there, infuriated at the violation occurring within her sacred walls. After he had had his way with the girl, Poseidon vanished as suddenly as he appeared. In his place, Athena revealed herself in all her majesty. Her face shone like the sun, and her eyes were terrible to behold. Medusa knelt, tears flowing down her cheeks. She was still enthralled from her liaison, while at the same time terrified at Athena's appearance. She knew she had been wrong to violate the temple's rules, yet she had fallen instantly in love. She looked into Athena's eyes and pleaded, Could even you, goddess? have resisted his bewitching words. Medusa's gown lay crumpled on the floor. Perhaps another goddess would have felt pity at her innocence, but not Athene. Her fury doubled at the girl's impertinence. In her rage, she turned Medusa into a monster called a gorgon. In a mere instant, the beautiful girl was transformed into a thing with a pig's tusks, large staring eyes, a wide-toothed mouth, and a lulling tongue. Wreathing snakes were in her hair. Worse, any mortal who looked into her eyes would instantly turn to stone. Athena banished her from the temple, sending her to live with two other gorgons who, ancient writers say, lived on an island near Libya. 
Those two were immortal, but Athene chose to keep Medusa mortal. As her fame grew, she shrunk from contact with mankind. Yet many men sought her out, landing on the island in search of glory. They stalked her through her gardens, spear or sword in hand. Yet one by one, each was turned to stone. As time passed, her heart hardened, and she embraced her role. She became increasingly vicious. Even Athena lamented creating the Gorgon. And with that background, we introduce Perseus, the great Greek hero who arrived like death on cat's paws to end Medusa's life. What happened? You may recall a king's daughter named Dany from another episode in the series. Dany was acclaimed as the most beautiful of all mortals. As you know by now, in ancient Greece, overwhelming beauty could be a curse. It was as problematic as the grim prophecies kings so frequently heard about their future. Dany's father had received a prophecy that if she conceived a son, the boy would grow up to kill him. Consequently, the king created a bronze chamber below the ground and condemned Dany to live there. Guards were stationed at its one door day and night. His plan seemed ingenious. No man would ever see her, and the king could live without fear. Yet the fates had other ideas. Zeus got involved. He had glimpsed Dany before her entombment and was love-struck. Unable to resist her, he waited until Dany was safely locked away. A single slotted window had been built into the chamber to allow air and sun to enter, but it was so narrow that even Zeus could not slip through. As Dany slept one night, Zeus transformed himself into a shower of gold and cascaded silently through the narrow slot. He took the girl as she slept. Inevitably, Dany gave birth to a boy, and she named him Perseus. When the king learned what had happened, he knew he would put his life at risk if he killed Zeus's offspring. Yet, he was haunted by the prophecy. He resolved his fears by setting Dany and the boy adrift at sea in a large wooden chest. The king believed that either the chest would sink or that they would come ashore somewhere so far away that his own life would not be at risk. But he foolishly discounted Zeus's interest in the girl, and Poseidon returned to play a role. Zeus called on the sea god to protect Dany and ensure that she and Perseus survived the journey. Poseidon did just that, steering them toward the Cycladic island of Seraphos. There the chest was found by a fisherman when it was washed ashore. Taken aback by the woman's beauty and her son's perfection, he gave them food and shelter. Was this the end of the strange saga? Hardly. Dany's beauty was quickly reported to the local king, who came to see for himself. The king was stunned by her appearance. At first he tried to seduce her, showering her with jewels and compliments, but she rejected his efforts. Then, in desperation, he proposed marriage, but Dany felt betrothed to Zeus, and repeatedly rejected his offers. Eventually, her son grew strong enough to act as Dany's protector. Aware of Perseus's almost divine strength, the king made no attempt to overpower him. Instead, he tried to outwit him. He promised that if Perseus brought him the head of Medusa, he would marry another woman and leave Dany in peace. Perseus accepted the challenge. 
which set Mount Olympus abuzz. As the son of the greatest of the Olympians, he was aided by some of the gods as he began his quest. Zeus ordered them to outfit Perseus in preparation. Hades gave him a cap of invisibility. Hermes gave him winged sandals. Athene bestowed a reflective shield. And Hephaestus, the great craftsman, gave him a razor-sharp, unbreakable sword. Flying swiftly on Hermes' winged sandals, Perseus found the cave where the Gorgons lived. He waited patiently until all three slept, then slowly entered, taking care not to wake them. Using Athene's reflective shield like a mirror to locate Medusa, he then stepped backwards toward the sleeping Gorgon. Hades' cap allowed him to be invisible. He made sure not to view Medusa except in the shield, knowing that eye contact would turn him to stone. As he crept closer, he turned suddenly, swinging Hephaestos' sword in an arc and beheaded her as she slept. Her earlier union with Poseidon did not result in offspring until now. As her head was lopped off, two children leapt from the opening and fled. Perseus, still careful not to view the head, stuffed it into a bag which he tied off. Rising into the air on Hermes' sandals, he turned toward home. But as he neared his destination, he came across a strange sight. A woman was struggling to free her legs, which were embedded in a stone beside the sea. He stopped asking, Who did this to you? Then pausing, he asked, And what is your name? My name is Andromeda, and I was promised in marriage to my childhood sweetheart. Then I was captured by a sea monster who taunts us both. No one can free me, and worse, the monster vows to eat me at any moment. Perseus struck the stone with his sword, splitting it with a single blow. Andromeda stepped free. At that very instant, the monster rose from the sea, screeching and hurling water in all directions. As it clawed at them in its fury, Perseus again drew his sword and killed it. And on a whim, Perseus proposed marriage to Andromeda. Before she could answer, her betrothed appeared. Seeing Perseus, he demanded, Who are you? Step away from my bride-to-be. I am Perseus, he answered, and obviously stronger than you, as I have freed the girl and killed the monster. The man lunged at Perseus, but Perseus stepped aside and drew Medusa's head from his bag. The groom-to-be looked at it and was instantly turned to stone. It was clear to Andromeda that she lived solely due to Perseus's intervention. We know that the gifts from the gods helped him prevail against the Gorgon, but his innate decency and courage had saved Andromeda from certain death. She extended her hand to except his offer of marriage, and with that, Perseus and Andromeda left for his home. They would show the king the Gorgon's head and save his mother. So what happened when Perseus returned to the king with his proof of success? Was the king prepared to marry any woman other than Dany? No. To Perseus's shock, the king had only increased his pursuit of Dany. She had been forced to seek sanctuary in a temple. Perseus spoke secretly to his mother, then, without announcing his return, began tracking the king and biding his time. At last, when the king and his most loyal followers were gathered in a large room, Perseus entered. He thundered. Greetings, I have returned from my assignment. The king, taken aback at his appearance, said confidently, 
You have come to report that you failed to obtain Medusa's head. On the contrary, Perseus smiled. Impossible, the king retorted. I sent you on an impossible mission, but I'm prepared to forgive your failure. That is, I am prepared to forgive you if your mother agrees to become my wife. With that final confirmation of the king's treachery, Perseus pulled Medusa's head from his bag. The king and all assembled stared at what Perseus held high, and each instantly turned to stone. Before we can wind up this famous tale... Let's return to Dany's father. Remember the prophecy he'd received. The oracle warned that Dany's son would kill the king. And to protect himself, he pushed them off into the sea, hoping they'd perish or land in some far away land. As it was, the prophecy was fulfilled. Years later, as Perseus competed in an athletic contest, the discus he threw was caught by a gust of wind. It spun out of control and hit Dany's father, who, unbeknownst to Perseus, was in attendance. The blow killed him on the spot. Escaping the fates was an impossibility. And what happened to Andromeda? She and Perseus had many children. One of their grandchildren, in fact, became as famous as Perseus. You've heard his name. I refer to the famous Heracles, who inherited his grandfather's strength and bravery. At the end of Andromeda's life, in deference to Perseus, Athena flung her into the heavens where she became the Andromeda constellation. And Dany? We don't know what happened to her. Some say she founded her own kingdom, while others claim she traveled with Perseus and Andromeda. And in the end, Perseus lost his life to a man named Megapenthes, who himself simply acted to fulfill the great moral dictates against killing a parent, even if by accident. Yet in the end, Perseus, like Andromeda, was granted eternal fame. He too became a constellation hovering in the night sky beside his wife. So what can we conclude from this strange tale? The story of Perseus recounts one man's character, bravery, and wit. But it also starkly illustrates the cruel fate of many women. The beautiful Medusa, seduced by Poseidon, was, in her innocence, punished by Athene. Transformed into a monster, Medusa lived long enough to be hounded by glory-seekers and finally beheaded by Perseus. Was he, in turn, punished for killing this once-naive, once-beautiful woman? No. Instead, he became one of Greece's most famous heroes, and the gods, immoral as always, simply watched. Join me for the next episode of Garner's Greek Mythology. This is your host, Patrick Garner. If you love what you hear, be sure to visit patrickgarnerbooks.com or find me on Amazon. I assure you, my novels about the Greek gods are as entertaining as my podcasts.